No, Rena. Oh, it's okay. Nice to meet you. That's some people who are in your group, I guess. Okay, well, uh, let's get started. Um, so uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome Andrea Liu. Um, uh, she's coming to us from Penn. Um, so uh, Andrea got her PhD from Cornell. Um, uh, she did a, a brief stint as faculty at UCLA before moving to Penn uh, in years. 10 years. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, before moving to Penn uh, uh, in 2004. So, um, so uh, Andrea comes from Soft Condensed Matter, um, and she's done uh, a lot of work uh, in jamming, uh, some of which with, with our very own Corey O'Hearn, who I don't see here. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, um, recently, uh, she's moved into biology, where she's applied a very similar uh, approach of really, really giving a physicist side um, to problems across a wide range of scale in biology, um, including some looking at electromechanical coupling in heart muscle and um, uh, a flow uh, through capillary networks and um, uh, many interesting things. Um, uh, she was elected to the National Academy in 2017, and she's now the director of the Center for Soft and Living Matter at Penn. Um, it's a great pleasure to have him here, uh, and let's please welcome Andrew Liu. Mm -hmm.
Thank you so much, Ben. It's been, I've had a great day here. It's been really fun and uh, especially happy to come back to see my dear friend and former colleague, Allison Sweeney. So, um, so uh, I'm gonna talk today about how we have tried to learn from biology and computer science to make progress in designing materials and then how that has in the end we think given us another way to do things um, that might even be of interest to, um, we hope eventually to biologists and computer scientists. So, um, um, so what's, oh yes, the, sorry, first the shameless advertisement for the Center for Soft and Living Matter at Penn. So it brings together more than 60 faculty. I mean, the number of faculty who really self-identify as working in soft and living matter, which of course does not include biologists. Most biologists would not say that they are working on living matter, right there. <laughs> so, so uh, but this spans uh, more than 10 departments. Um, and uh, and uh, it's it's really great. We're just getting started where we just moved out of our, the whole condensed matter physics group moved out of our space into swing space while they remodeled to make some nice space for the center. So uh, come and join us. Uh, if you're a graduate student for a postdoc, um, if you're an undergraduate for graduate studies um, or come and do your sabbatical with us. Um, all right, so my the title of my talk, I said, you know, using inverse inverse design and metamaterials. That sounds so faddish. I feel a little embarrassed about that, but but there there is actually reason for it. Uh, metamaterials are interesting. Um, so these are materials that have properties that are not naturally found um, in ordinary materials, and those come from from their design structures, not from you know what they're actually made out of. Okay, so um, so and what do I mean by this? So so the example that has been a great inspiration to us um, is um, allosteric proteins. So a lot of signaling proteins and enzymes, in particular, are allosteric, and so unlike man-made enzymes. Uh, catalysts, which just sort of go until they get fouled and then they stop, right? Um, biological catalysts are much more clever. They can be turned on and off. Uh, uh, many of them use allosteric to do that. So the idea is the following. Suppose you have some molecule that wants to bind to this and get chemically modified, okay? So that's the thing that undergoes the chemical transformation when it's, when it's uh, bound to the protein, to this enzyme, okay? Um, but right now, the way it's drawn, this thing cannot bind, okay? It cannot bind until this other kind of molecule called the regulatory molecule binds over here to the, to the protein. When it does that, it triggers a conformational change in the protein that now allows this thing to bind. Okay, so that's an example of turning the enzyme on and you can do the reverse where it turns it off. Any of them have allosteric sites for turning it off on another allosteric site for turning it off. Okay, um, now if I think about what's happening in mechanical terms, what we're doing is we're applying some strain over here, okay? And it's producing a comparable magnitude strain over here, okay? Now you say, oh, what's the big deal? Elasticity is long range, right? But deformation actually decays quite rapidly. So if you put in numbers for the moduli of proteins and so forth, what you would end up naturally getting is a response at the target, which is two or three orders of magnitude smaller than the strain that you apply here, okay? So if you apply strain here, what you'd expect to get over here is two or three orders of magnitude smaller, but instead what you're getting is a response that's of the same order as the source strain. And that's special. That's not a property that materials usually have, and that's why we consider allosteric proteins to be metamaterials. They have this special property. So um, <clears throat> talking to my uh, wonderful colleague, um, Eleni Katafori, um, and uh, she got very excited because it turns out the brain vascular system does almost the same thing, okay? So um, 
the brain uses actually a huge fraction of the oxygen that comes in to our bodies. And it does that to support brain function. That oxygen is important for supporting brain function. So right now I'm talking, my speech cortex needs extra oxygen. So the, what my brain vascular system is doing, okay, is it's taking blood flow. So there's a source, okay, input, um, big pressure drops across the artery. They go into the brain, they feed the brain, okay? But then what's happening is that individual blood vessels in this network, okay, are either contracting or dilating in order to direct extra blood flow to my speech cortex to give me extra oxygen there. Okay, now if I stop talking and start jumping up and down, of course you'd think I was crazy, mm -hmm. but my brain vascular system would just adjust, right? And send extra blood flow to my um, just mortar cortex. So, so it's an amazing, amazing system, okay? That just sends extra blood flow on demand to different parts of the brain. Um, and why is that why we call this flow allosteri? Why? Because there's a source pressure drop at the artery, okay? And then there's a target, which is variable, okay? But where you also have large pressure drops, okay? So, um, so it's very similar to the mechanical networks. And in fact, if you're going to solve one problem, you might as well solve them both because mathematically they're almost identical. It's just the flow networks are simple, like 1D version of mechanical networks. And the simple way to see that is that if you have something, for example, a central force spring network that's in mechanical equilibrium, right? It's, it's minimizing the energy. And it's at, in mechanical equilibrium, you're at a minimum of the energy and the net force on every node in your network is zero, right? And the analog in the flow networks is that the power dissipated is at a minimum and that gives you Kirchhoff's law at every node, okay. no net current at every node. Okay, so, um, so the mathematics is really very similar. And um, in fact, the mathematics for low Reynolds number of flow networks is the same as for linear electrical resistor networks. Okay, they're this exactly the same problem. It's just for, for pressure substitute voltage. So think of this as just an electrical circuit, right? Voltages where your brain is in, is adjusting the resistance on, on at the each edge in this network to send extra um, current or big voltage drops to certain spots on demand. All right. Um, so, so now suppose we wanted to start and to design networks to have this property. Okay. Um, we want to, why do we want to design networks to have this property? Well, because then we can look at thousands of them and we can have actually ensembles and we can start trying to understand what are the microscopic origins of this collective phenomenon, which is allosteric, right? So as a condensed matter physicist, I'm naturally interested in having an ensemble of systems that can do the same thing. And I can't get that from biology. So what we're going to do is try to design it into networks, okay? Um, so, uh, so usually, right, what you solve is the, what's called in computer science, the forward problem. In other words, you apply some strain over here at the source, and then you know the spring constants, you know your, your network, and you just calculate what's the strain at the target, okay? So that's what we usually do. But um, what we need to solve here is a different question. What we're asking is what network will produce the desired strain at the target, given that I'm applying the source strain. Okay, I'm not specifying the network. I want to know which network will give me the right answer, the answer that I want. Okay, and that's called the inverse problem. Okay, <clears throat> and so usually in physics, what the way we've been solving the inverse materials design problem is to solve the forwards problem exhaustively and then try to interpolate. Okay, but this is a huge design space. I imagine I can choose for a spring network. I could choose, for example, just central four springs. I can choose the stiffness of every spring and its equilibrium constant or the springs even there or not there, right? There's a huge uh, space of, of degrees of freedom to explore. 
So that's a very high dimensional problem and exhaustive solution of the forward problem is really not practical. So is there a better way to do it? Okay, and we came on upon this because we're using machine learning methods to, um, to learn physics um, and start, start learning about how machine learning works. It's like, wow, this is really very clever, okay? So what we did was we decided to do it the way machine learning, a machine learning algorithm would do it. So very simply put, okay, suppose you have an artificial neural network and you want it to train to, you know, on a bunch of images of cats and dogs, you want to train it to be able to distinguish cats from dogs, okay? Uh, you're asking the same question. You say, what network will give me the right answer? You know, dog pictures coming out uh, give, uh, with a large output here, cat pictures give me a large output there, okay? So that's exactly the same question that we're asking about our mechanical networks. Um, and the way they do it, Okay, computer scientists do it. It's clever, very clever. Well, okay, Let's say that physicists did come up with this. <laughs> also, and John Hopfield deserves a, a ton of credit for this. Okay, so, but the idea is that, but okay, anyway, I won't get onto that dangerous path of physicists having discovered everything. Okay. Um, but uh, the learning, what, what you do is you construct a learning cost function, right? And what you, and the idea is that you compare, you take this learning cost function and you say, okay, every time I feed it an image of a cat and a dog, okay, it's going to give me some answer here, okay, which may not be the right answer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the answer I get, I'm going to subtract it from the answer I wanted. And I don't know if that's positive or negative, so I'm going to square it and I'm going to minimize that. And I'm going to minimize that. Um, the sum over all of the outputs, okay? And I'm gonna minimize this learning cost function with respect to learning degrees of freedom, which are, for example, the way these inputs of, uh, outputs of these nodes get summed up to give you this, what happens at this node, okay? So you adjust properties of the nodes, okay? In order to uh, minimize this learning cost function. So what you end up doing is gradient descent on the learning cost function with respect to the learning degrees of freedom, okay? And that's done by clever methods like backpropagation, okay? So that's how you solve the inverse problem in computer science. So, oh, why don't we do the same thing? We've got a network. We'll just do the, exactly the same thing. So we're gonna construct a learning cost function, okay? Which is the desired strain at the target, okay, delta minus the actual strain that I get. I'm going to square it, okay? And then we're going to minimize this with respect to the learning degrees of freedom. And these are things that we usually keep fixed, right? But this is like the stiffnesses and this equilibrium lengths of my springs, okay? There's only one problem. This is a physical system. And because it's a physical system, it's more complicated than an artificial neural network on the computer because it has to also minimize the energy if I'm at zero temperature or the free energy if I'm at non-zero temperature, right? And so I'm gonna call that the physical cost function, okay? That is just a requirement because it's a physical system. And that is minimized with respect to the node positions. So I have two different cost functions. I have a learning cost function, which embodies what I want my material to be able to do then I have a physical cost function, which my material must always satisfy. And I must simultaneously minimize both, each with respect to a different set of degrees of freedom, the learning degrees of freedom and the physical degrees of freedom. And the point is that these two degrees of freedom are coupled together, right? If I change the spring constants, I'm gonna change the node positions and then I have to readjust and minimize the energy, okay? Um, and so each time I change my learning degrees of freedom, I have to re-minimize my physical cost function with respect to my physical degrees of freedom, okay? I'm talking about this like a computer science problem, but you know what I mean. I'm just finding the new positions of the nodes once I change the spring constants that are in response to the source strength. Okay, so that's yeah. because you were trying to have the thing be at equilibrium 
if it doesn't have the incoming uh, uh, thing which makes the strain at the far end appear. Is that what you're saying? I, no, I, I actually wanted I want in mechanical equilibrium when the source strain is applied that I want this this response at the target to be the equilibrium response to that strain. Okay, when the source strain is applied. When the source strain is applied, yes, that's right. Okay, so in this case, so the equivalent of the forward calculation, the computer science problem is we're gonna minimize the energy with respect to where the nodes are, right? And the back propagation, the other thing, the other step is I'm going to use gradient descent to minimize the learning cost function with respect to learning degrees of freedom. And I must simultaneously do gradient descent on both. And so we call this the double gradient descent problem. Okay. All right. So I just want to show you that that works. So here's a network. Okay. It was generated from a jam packing because that's what we had lying around when we started doing this. And, um, and so um, this is the source. Okay, there's a strain across this edge, which I'm going to call one. Okay, and then we're going to the initial strain across the target edge is, you know, uh, um, 0 0.005. Okay, so two and a half orders of magnitude smaller. Now I'm going to start tuning the spring constants. And as I do that, okay, the target strain just keeps going up because I'm doing gradient descent on my learning cost function. So I'm getting closer, my strain at the target is getting closer and closer to the desired value, which is one, okay? The blue dash ones are the ones that are effectively removed, removed altogether. But in the end, I get the desired strain, okay, of one. So it's the same magnitude as the source strain as it is in biology, okay? Same thing uh, for the pressure for a flow network. So now imagine the brain vascular system, right? I've got a, a given pressure drop across these two nodes, okay? The initial pressure drop across these is again about two and a half orders of magnitude smaller. And now I start tuning the conductivities of the edges, okay? Imagine dilating or, or contracting or dilating the blood vessels. And uh, again, the blue dash ones are, um, and the ones have very low conductance. And as I do that, the pressure goes up until it reaches the desired value 0.2, okay? So that's amazing. We couldn't believe it at first, okay? But it turns out that if you want a target response, a strain that's of the same magnitude as the source strain, this is the success rate, okay? And when this is one, okay, the success rate is very close to 100%. Okay, that doesn't start to drop until until you get above that. You know, so so if you want a, a, a strain at the target that ten that's ten times higher, okay, that you can do that about eighty percent of the time. Um, the amazing thing that is that in a network of a thousand bonds in three dimensions, not an unreasonable size. Okay, it turns out on average you have to remove five bonds to get the desired response. That's it. Okay, so it's actually incredibly easy to get allosteric. That got the attention of Ken Dill, uh, who does proteins. Uh, he is very interested because it turns out that proponents of intelligent design, their exhibit A for why you must need intelligent design is allosteric. Like, oh, how could you possibly get allosteric? And what we're finding is like, in these networks, you hardly have to do anything to get allosteric and you have like 100% success. So, um, so, okay, um, it's so robust that you can do it in real life. And these, is Needy here? Needy, raise your hand. So Needy did these experiments when she was a graduate student with Sid Nagel. So, so uh, my student, Jason Rocks, computed the, you know, on the computer, did gradient descent, found these networks, and then Needy laser cut them, okay? Now, these are laser cut runs from, from something, okay, Needy knows what it is. Um, and, and it's not a central four spring network, okay? But, but look, so here's the strain at the target. Okay, that's the target. Now I'm gonna pull at the source, okay? And you see this big response at the target, okay? It's incredibly robust. And this is well out of the linear regime. We did, we trained for this in the linear regime, but this is doing it well out of linear regime 
it's so robust, it, it actually works, okay, um, in real life. And here's a 3D example. And I would be showing you a movie, but I'm such a theorist that when I was given this beautiful thing, um, the needy made, I broke it within five minutes of getting it. <laughs> so I never had a chance to make a movie. <laughs> so, okay. Um, all right. So this is great, right? This is fantastic. Um, except for one thing, okay? Well, very big thing. Both doing the forward calculation, minimizing the energy with respect to the node positions, okay? And minimizing the learning cost function to, with respect to, for example, the spring constants, both of these require a computer. We did this all in the computer, right? And then they were printed out or, or, or laser cut. Okay. Um, that's not scalable. If I wanted to actually have a network that I could hold in my hand that was, you know, built out of, say, nanoscale components or something, so, uh, something that's actually material, right? So I have a huge number of repeated edges, and, um, and uh, I wouldn't be able to do this calculation, right? Because I would need to know everything about the network geometry and topology and the edge conductances. I need to know all of these, or, or spring constants, I would need all of these to be able to evaluate the learning cost function, calculate the gradient. And then I would need to be able to go in with these tiny tweezers and adjust each edge according to how I wanted it. Okay, according to what gradient to census. This is just not possible in real life. Okay, and so that's the problem that minimizing cost function is inherently a global process and that requires a processor. That is a problem for artificial neural networks too. They require that large neural networks they require very large process, lots and lots of processors, and right, and chew up enormous amounts of power um, to do it. So, th so this is a problem. So then we start thinking: Is there a way that networks can learn to become metric materials without a processor? Okay, um, and um, so. For this, let's try to take some inspiration from the brain, okay? So here's an artificial neural network. Here's the real thing, okay? Well, the brain doesn't need to be connected to a computer in order to work, right? The brain is its processor, right? So that's, so this, the brain doesn't need a processor, unlike the artificial neural network that lives on, on a computer. Here, the learning is concentrated in the processor. So if any damage occurs to that, you're, it's over, okay? But the brain, you can actually damage the brain considerably and it can still learn. In fact, there was recently a paper, I can't remember if it was nature or science, but they were studying people who had actually half of their brains removed because of severe epilepsy and found that they could do image recognition almost nearly, almost as well as people with a full brain, okay? So it's, it's just really, it's pretty incredible. Okay, so in, uh, and speech recognition, you know, the, so, and that's because learning is really distributed through the brain. Um, um, so that makes it very robust to damage. The other thing is, right, this requires incredible amounts of power. Since our Google uses 0.3% of the world's power. Um, uh, whereas the brain requires very little power to operate. Enough that, you know, we can eat and, and do a lot of other things and still could run. Okay, so, so is there a way that materials can learn that's more like the brain? So the first thing we came up to, and this was with Sid and, and Needy, uh, first author on this paper, was directed aging. So the idea of it was this, okay? Suppose I have my central force spring network, and now instead of minimizing the learning cost function, I'm gonna replace that by applying boundary conditions. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply the strain that I want at the source, and simultaneously I'm gonna apply the target strain that I want, okay? And if I can minimize the physical cost function, the energy with respect to the learning degrees of freedom, then the energy that when I apply the source strain to get that target strain will be low. That's the idea, okay? 
And so if you imagine just, if you do this and you do this calculation, so I'm gonna call this the clamp condition where I apply the source and the target that I want, okay? That's what I'm gonna call the clamp boundary condition. If I clamp the system at what I want, okay? And now I just do gradient descent on my learning degrees of freedom of the energy, which physics says we always wanna minimize the energy if we can, right? Then I'm gonna minimize this energy um, uh, with respect to the equilibrium constants. And look what happens. The equation for the equilibrium constant of bond I just depends on the tension across bond I. So what this is saying is that if the spring gets stretched under the source strain and the desired target strain, I'm gonna let this, this spring get longer. It's equilibrium length is gonna get longer. If it gets compressed, the equilibrium length is gonna get shorter. Very natural learning rule. You just implement this learning rule, right? And the idea is then um, gradient descent, just minimizing, okay, according to that learning rule, will give us a low energy when we apply the source, just the source, okay? And then maybe we'll get the desired target. Sure. So this works on the computer. So here is a network, okay? Uh, I'm applying a source strain here. In fact, I'm applying a cycle of the source strain and I apply the cycle of the target strain. So it's gonna be the opposite. So when the source, the source bond is elongated, the target is compressed. Okay, so it's, they're out of phase. And um, after every cycle of doing this, during each cycle, I'm gonna be adjusting the equilibrium length. That's a rate, okay? And, um, and, and after each cycle, I do a readout. So I, I, I do a cycle with the clamp condition where I'm letting the spring equilibrium lengths evolve. And then I'm gonna just apply the source and look at what I get at the target, okay? And that's what's plotted here. So this is what I get at the source is the green and the signal at the target in this readout where I'm just applying the source is you see going up as I let the system adjust under the clamp condition, okay? It's going up and up and eventually does reach the target strain of one, okay? So, this is great because all we're doing is building in a local rule that the spring is going to elongate if it's stretched. The equilibrium length is going to get longer if it's stretched and shorter if it's compressed. Each spring doesn't know, need to know what the other springs are doing. It's just blindly following this rule. Okay. I don't need a processor to calculate the gradient descent or adjust anything. Every spring's adjusting itself on its own just based on what it feels itself. Okay. So um, so that's working. Okay. But that's still not scalable. Why? Because we're doing it on the computer and we still have to minimize the energy with respect to, in this case, not only the physical degrees of freedom, but also the learning degrees of freedom. I still have this one. Okay, I saw to minimize this. And that required a processor to do it. Okay, that the thing I just showed you required a processor. But then you think, aha, uh -huh, but if I could do this in the lab, right? Then physics is gonna minimize the physical cost function for me. It's totally free. I don't have to lift a finger, okay? So the key is to implement this in the lab, okay? So the first thing we tried was actually something different. It's the negative Poisson ratio. So Needy took a solid foam and she laser cut this network out of it, okay? And then she applied the clamp condition. So here we were looking for negative Poisson ratio. So what's Poisson ratio? Poisson ratio is if I squeeze the thing in this direction, normally it would expand in the two orthogonal directions, right? And negative Poisson, ratio material is special because when I compress in this direction, it actually compresses in these two directions. And a maximally negative Poisson ratio is when I compress in this direction and it compresses in the orthogonal directions by the same amount, okay? Um, and that's called a Poisson ratio minus one. And, um, and uh, you know, cork 
right, has a Poisson ratio of about zero. That's why it's so useful for wine bottles because it doesn't expand or compress when you, when you squeeze it into the bottle. Anyway, but naturally, very few natural materials have negative Poisson ratio. It's in fact, tendons uh, apparently do. Okay, so, um, so Nidhi took this foam, okay, and then she put it in a, a frame that's too small for it. She sent me when I have my own. Um, it's very cool. Um, so you put it in a frame that's too small. You wait, okay? You take it out. So what is happening when it's in this frame that's too small? Well, this foam is deforming plastically. And the regions that are under more stress are deforming more. It's not a central force network by any means. We have no idea what's going on. Very complicated, okay? But the regions that are under greater stress are deforming more. You take this thing out of the, the frame and it has a negative Poisson ratio. So cool, okay? It actually does work. But it actually doesn't work for Alistair. <laughs> it's really, really hard. So, so why, and we can, I could go on, oh, you know, ISIS test, I could start talking about things, why it doesn't work. But the real problem in the end is that the learning cost function is not the energy, the physical cost function with this clamp condition. Okay. And, and this is where uh, my postdoc, Naki Stern, comes in. I should say the theoretical work, the experimental work was done by Needy, the theoretical work on directed aging was done by a very, very talented postdoc. Daniel Hexner, who is now at Technion uh, Tenure Track. Um, okay. Um, the real problem is that this is not right. So, is there another way to do it? This was where my postdoc, Naki Stern, comes in, because I think this is quite brilliant. Uh, you borrow from neuroscience and uh, machine learning uh, and do what's called contrastive learning. Okay. And we discovered that it, there was actually uh, developed already as, okay, um, almost the same, not quite the same, not quite as physically natural, but um, in the machine learning literature. Okay, so um, here's the idea. So remember the clamped condition where I apply the source and the desired target response. And the idea was directed aging is we would do this and we would wait, right, and let the system age and then when we just apply the source, letting the target do what it wants, we would get the desired response, right? That was the idea. So let's do this formally. We say, okay, our original cost function was we want our desired response to be the same as the free response, okay? And we have to square it because we don't know which one's bigger, and then we minimize that. What we're going to look at instead is a contrastive function, which is the energy in the clamped condition minus the energy of the free condition. The great thing about this is that this is guaranteed to be positive. I don't have to square it. Why? Because I'm uh, applying more, more constraints in the clamp case than I am in the free case. So it's got to cost more energy. So, so this is already non-negative. I don't need to square it, okay? Now, if I take this and I now do gradient descent on this, what I get is the rule for changing my equilibrium length is, is, the, is the tension greater? Is the spring getting pulled more in the clamp case than the free case? If so, I'm going to increase my equilibrium length. Is it getting put less in the clamp case than the free case? Well, then I decrease my equilibrium length. Okay, so that's the rule that's implemented and it only depends on what's happening on that one edge J, okay? So it's a local rule. Um, and the cool thing is that if you take your, instead of applying the desired target response right away, you take a more patient approach and you gradually nudge yourself from the response that you actually have towards the desired response, then you can show, right, that this, Minimizing this gives you the minimum to this, okay? So that these should have the same minima. And, uh, and so you're actually minimizing the desired, the, the real learning cost function by doing this, okay? So you can show that. Um, right, that that's, in, that's in here. Okay, so, um, so that's really cool. 
Okay, because now we can do it locally. Each edge just needs to know what's happening there and respond to that. Doesn't have to know what the rest of the system is doing. This is in principle scalable. And, and, uh, and you can do the same for a flow or electrical network, right? In this case, it's the power difference in the plant clamped and free state. In each case, it's the physical cost function. We're comparing the physical cost function under two different boundary conditions. Okay, now this works. It can do allosteric. So this is the, the mean squared error. This is, this is this learning cost function. Okay, and we can show, yeah, it's decreasing. Okay, over time as we follow these rules. Um, and for flow networks and for mechanical networks, the error goes down to zero. Okay, it works. Um, and we can even do classification. Now we've got something much more sophisticated than what we, we had before. We can do more sophisticated learning cost functions. So we can learn how to recognize handwritten digits, uh, zero and one. Uh, so the idea is here, we're taking as the inputs the top 25 principal components of the images and the output nodes are here and here. So this one is large when I have a zero and this one is trained to be large when I have a one. Okay, so we were able to train on these images and then get the right answer on test sets. Okay, um, so that works. Um, but that was still on the computer, right? It's no good on the computer because I still have to minimize my cost function, my physical cost function, and that still requires a computer. All right, so just having these coupled learning local rules is not enough. We have to implement it in the lab in order to really realize that the, the advantages of this. And so this is where, right? This is where colleague Doug Durian and our postdoc Sam Delarue come in. Okay. So this is really clever. Okay, so the, this is the first generation. You just have digital variable resistors that you can easily buy, and they have a bunch of different resistance values, okay? Um, and you can click um, among them, up or down, okay? Um, but then the question is, how do you compare the local power, okay, in, resistor, in a given resistor in the free and the clamped states? Remember this local rule depends on the difference in power in the clamped and the free states or the voltage squared across that edge, okay? And the clamped and the free states. Now on a computer, I just put on the clamp boundary condition, put it in memory. I put on the free boundary condition, compare the two, okay? And, and adjust my conductance, okay? But we want to be able to do this without a processor and without memory, okay? Without external memory. So how are we gonna, you, we cannot apply two different boundary conditions, the free and the clamped boundary conditions at the same time to the same system, right? So how do you compare these things? How do you do this? Well, the idea is the following. This is really clever. This is, this is Doug's idea that you build two identical networks, okay? One runs the free boundary condition. The other one runs the clamped boundary condition, okay? Here is this, these twin edges on a single breadboard. Um, and then you just have some circuitry that's going to compare the voltage drop across one and with the voltage drop across the other and adjust the variable resistor up or down. A little circuitry to do that. And in fact, they didn't even do the real coupled learning rule. The real coupled learning rule says the change of conductance is just proportional to the voltage squared across the edge and the clamped minus the free case. They just said, oh, at the voltage squared or the voltage, magnitude of the voltage is high in the clamp case. We're just gonna click the resistance up. If it's lower, you're just gonna click it down by one. So it's not even the exact learning rule, okay? Um, and this thing can do classification. So, so, uh, here's a schematic of the network. Oh, I forgot. I still have not brought. I just want to show you an, a picture of the real network. Come on. How can I cannot? Oh, well. 
It was on the very first slide. I had a picture of the actual network. Uh, you'll see a picture of our second generation network. But the network looks like this, okay? It's pitiful. Nine nodes and 16 edges. It's tiny because Sam had to build this by hand, right? Their first generation. And, but the, it can classify this. There's a famous data set, the IRIS data set. It's a baby. Yeah, this is a baby problem. Nobody takes it seriously in computer science. But um, you feed it four measurements of an iris flower, okay? And there are three different species, and the idea is based on these four measurements, classify these three different species of irises, okay? So we have four inputs, okay, plus ground. One of these is ground, and then we have four inputs for the voltages corresponding to these four measurements, okay? And then there are the outputs, one for each species a flower. And what you see is that the classification error goes down and it actually eventually gets to about 3%, which is what linear classifiers give you on the computer. Okay, so it works as well as a classifier, a similar thing on the computer. So it really works. Um, but what's really cool, oh no, now I've really screwed things up. Oh no, here I, this is what I get for Okay, um, so uh, what's really cool is, right, for different tasks, you don't have to rebuild the circuit. The circuit's just there. It's the same learning rule for each task, and that's what's built in the circuit. What changes is just the boundary conditions, okay? So we can just teach it one thing after another. So we taught it how to classify the irises, and we say, okay, take that network that we got from classifying irises, now I, I have a ground node and I have a source voltage here and I want to get a desired target voltage there, Alistair. Okay, it learns that. This is the mean squared error, the learning cross function going down. Okay, then I say, no, no, no. Uh, one source and two different targets here, it learns that. Two sources, three targets uh, desi with desired tar voltages, it does that. You know, this is... Uh, one source and four targets, it can do that. And we say, oh, oh, you know, why don't you solve two equations and two unknowns? It does that. Okay, solve a different set of two equations and two unknowns, it does that. I mean, it's a tiny circuit, so we're not asking it to do anything terribly ambitious, but it can do it one thing after another. Okay, now, so, so it's adaptive learning. It's adaptive learning. It is learning different things, uh, um, you know, as you go. Um, so it's getting closer to the brain, right? Uh, in that it doesn't need the need a processor. Learning is distributed, of course. It's, it's so uh, it's pitiful compared to the brain, but still, we're we're, half, we're proud of it. Um, the question is: Is it as robust to damage? It should be, since the learning is distributed, right? So now Sam just went in and started ripping out edges. Okay, <laughs> started wreaking havoc on his network. He was very sad. Oh, no, he, of course, he did it in a way that was reversible. Um, so uh, so uh, he trained the network, mean squared error went down, and then he clipped this edge, mean squared error jumped back up, but now trained it again, and it found a new solution. Clipped out this edge, found another solution. Okay, this purple edge actually didn't matter at all. In fact, it was some, it took some work to find edges that made a difference. And uh, so he didn't even have to train it again, a uh, green, you know, so so in all, he could rip out five out of sixteen edges, and it could still learn the task. Okay, so very robust to damage. Um, why is that important? Well, okay, here's our second generation. So now uh, we brought in I, uh, Mark Miskin. His name should be here. Mark Miskin is our our, our wonderful young colleague in electrical engineering, um, who came in and designed a second generation thing, which is now just based on transistors. We don't have to buy these digital variable resistors. 
Okay. And so what that means is that this can easily be sent to a foundry. The design can be sent to a foundry and microfabricated so that we could scale up from, here's our laboratory version. It's now bigger, it's five by five, but still, um, you know, that's 25 nodes. Um, I forgot how many edges that corresponds to on a square lattice, but anyway, um, you know, we could scale up to millions of nodes with standard microfabrication methods and scale down the whole size from being on a table to, to a chip, right? Um, so it's, it's it, Mark has a postdoc who's just starting, who's starting to CAD this up to a center foundry, okay? The other nice thing about this design is that it is nonlinear. So up till now, we just had linear resistors, okay? And, um, and so it is known in machine learning that linear networks are not, don't learn as well as, cannot learn as many things as nonlinear ones. And they tend to also forget more easily, which we see. But now, uh, you know, for different gate voltages, this, this can be, uh, the IV characteristics can be nonlinear. And uh, this thing can actually learn XOR, which a linear circuit can't do. Okay. That's a picture of Sam with this apparatus. Terrific post Um All right. So, um, why are we excited? Because now we can really scale this up. So our first generation, you know, the step of adjusting each training step of adjusting the learning degrees of freedom took seconds. We've already speeded that up by four orders magnitude with Mark's design. Um, um, the second generation breadboard implementation that I showed you, okay, actually already is faster than solving the same problem on the computer. Okay. So, and, and as we scale it up, it will just get better. Um, so we think we can easily scale them up. It's totally reasonable to do it by a million. Uh, we can speed up the circuitry, circuitry to tens of microseconds. Uh, we've already speeded up the time to show each training example to change the voltages. You know, that used to be seconds. Now it's milliseconds. Um, and this consumes only, you know, one to 10 miles power. It's very okay. Um, and the fact that it's so robust to damage means that you don't have to manufacture it perfectly. There can be all sorts of problems with the manufacturing, but it should still be able to learn. Okay, so that's the advantage. That's what makes this scalable. Okay, so that's that's really it. The cool thing about this, what has us so excited is that the new circuits, we can read out the resistor of every edge or the resistance of each edge, the properties of each edge and node as it's learning. So we can follow the learning process. And that gives us a handle in this system of understanding the microscopic origins of learning. It's a collective emergent phenomenon. And we can start to, to look at that. So we're very excited. We, we've actually developed persistent homology methods that work for the proteins to understand how Alistair works. Um, and so, um, so, we're, so we're excited to learn about learning. Um, and you know, the fact that it's so massively scalable, we think, uh, we hope that maybe it will actually eventually replace artificial neural networks in applications where it's important to use uh, low power, um, you know, which is more and more important, of course, and or where there's high chance of damage. So um, these are the people who did the work. Um, Especially want to hire, highlight Naki Stern, who came up with this clever cup of learning, and Sam Villavu, who has implemented the lab, my former post at Jason Rocks, who first did the Alistair stuff, the, the double developed the double gradient descent, Daniel Hexner, uh, who did uh, worked with us on directed aging needy here, and Ermgard, um, who did the experimental implementations, and Carl which was my graduate student, who started us all off. Much of this. The stuff, all the stuff on uh, double gradient descent and directed aging was done by my wonderful collaborator for many years, almost a quarter century, Sid Nagel, um, and uh, uh, Eleni Katafori on the flow networks, and Doug and Mark now on these electrical circuits. So thanks very much. <laughs> See you.
Well, maybe I'll ask the first question. Um, uh, so are, are there, uh, what, what would it look like for a biological system to implement learning rules like this? Are there, um, for example, in finding uh, solutions to aliceric proteins um, or? So biology, we think did it in a very different way. Um, but maybe not so not, not so different that when you had the, the the regulatory molecule bound versus unbound, maybe the idea was that okay, that you know, swapping in this amino acid, it, there was there was less uh, less stress, you know, um, on on that amino acid uh, when when you substituted another one uh, at that site. Um, and so we are actually, one thing we're actually starting to do is to try, we're doing a whole bunch of stuff to get to the point where we could try to design Alistairy into a real protein with Ken Dill. We have to do that, you know, with serious force field calculations, 7D simulations with explicit water. This is not our thing, but that's why, we, why we're collaborating with Ken Dill, who knows all about this, but yeah. Um, but uh, so... Evolution, of course, does a does it in a very different way, but yeah, the result maybe is not so different. But other systems might have, you know, I I think this is an interesting question for an uh, interesting way to think about biology, especially process of development. So what I'm thinking is that during development, right, you're not programming in all the detailed information of who's going to go where which cell's gonna go where and all that, right? You're probably encoding more like local rules. And, and as a result, every organism is different, right? Um, it's not the same cells that go to the same places. My vascular system, brain vascular system is different from yours, right? But they both learn to do the same thing. Um, so, um, so, it could be that it has more to do with local rules that are pre present during development than, um, than you know, really this very precise blueprint that would require a computer to work it out. Along those lines, is an implication that all natural negative Poisson materials learn to be that way? They may not have learned to be that way. They may have evolved to be that way, right? But, um, but you know, I think one of the things that comes out of this is that we find it so easy to get there, and that makes it conceivable that they actually evolved to do it. Yeah. Um, so there's some sort of... Uh distributed encoding in the input information and for some data sets, say you chose the first 12 principal components. So I'm wondering whether that sort of pre-computation of which nodes to excite uh, given this input information helps in any way or whether you optimize over different ways to encode that information. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, we can choose a totally different set for our input nodes and, and we're fine. Yeah, it's really very robust. Yeah. Uh, so in my very naive understanding of the brain, like different parts of the brain are specialized to do different learning mechanisms. And in this case, uh, that small network is uh, designed to do one thing. So you, in that context, you like envision um, having multiple such networks interact in such a way that maybe their purpose could be diversified. It would be really, really interesting if we could have networks with, you know, different kinds of edges. So not all the edges having the same IV characteristics, but some having one, some having another, you know, and does that help the learning process? Does that heterogeneity at the local level actually help learning. So, so this is one of the things uh, we proposed in a proposal that wasn't funded, but we hope we will be able to do it someday um, uh, to, to look at. Yeah, it's sort of inspired by that, that property of the brain, which has many different kinds of neurons that do, do different things, you know? Yeah, That's a, it's a very interesting question. We don't know.
That was a fancy way of saying we don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, you mentioned speed improvements uh, with the small one over the insula filter. Do you have any intuition on how that's going to scale on the bigger manufacturer? So um, uh, we think it should it should not take more time as the system gets bigger because it's distributed. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the huge advantage. Instead of scaling linearly with system size, um, as the artificial neural networks do, this should scale like system size is zero power. You know, we'll we'll see if that's true. Yeah. And we think the power times to go will we'll have we're we're now doing back of the envelope calculations. I should say computer scientists, you know, they they have zero interest in it. We tried to publish this and it just kept turn, get, turning down and turned down. And we finally published it in FizRev Applied. Because you know, physicists like this thing, but people are not physicists like, what are you telling us about the iris data set? We want you to do ImageNet that has millions of images on a huge system and show that it's better. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> So we're trying to do serious back of the envelope back calculations. And if we can at least do that and, and show something about the scaling, yeah. then, then people might pay, start paying attention. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the um, charging of the edges in the brain. Uh, when you got the, the one end of the, the uh, jump and then the other will go down again, that's right and so once you cut that edge that edge is actually important for the learning and so once you cut it and it was gone you had to find a different solution that would minimize the learning cost function okay with different resistances on the edges and so it took a while for it to find it but some of them they were already effectively at very high resistances. So when you remove them, it didn't make any difference. So there is a, some kind of description that you can tell uh, which one uh, which one would correspond to why the system was closer from the yes. Yeah, so in our persistent homology analysis, what we find is when the system learns allosteric, okay. Um, it divides into sectors of nearly, for so just with one source and one target, it forms two sectors of nearly uniform node vo voltage. Okay, so within each sector, the, all the nodes have nearly the same voltage. And so if you remove an edge that's inside a sector, it makes no difference. It's the edges that are on the boundaries of sectors that count. And now if you rip one out and you have to reroute the boundary, it just finds another boundary because it's a topological thing. It just needs to go from one set, you know, to two. Yeah. So I'm trying to reconcile how this clearly very collective behavior is then encoded in a very local learning process. And I suppose the first question is, if this is a, a very local, uh, training procedure is at a risk of getting stuck at some local minimum and not really ever optimizing down to something that meets your target correctly. Yeah, so the key to that is to do what computer scientists do, which is to get use uh, have much many more learning degrees of freedom than you have constraints applied by what you it's prescribed by what you want. So if I only want one source of one target and I have all of the edges in the network to play with, then then basically the 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 learning cost function landscape is convex. It just has this big flat for global minimum and anywhere I start, I can just reach that minimum. It's it's when I'm asking too much. I, I have a task that's too complex for the size of my network that I will tend to fall into local minima. And yes, I think it'll be easier to get into local minima with these local learning rules than with the global thing. But you know, as long as our network's big enough, we can avoid that. So, uh, as a related fact, I was confused uh, uh, at the very earliest case where you showed a military solution. Is it just one solution or are there degenerate solutions that would also be equally good 
Yes, there are tons of solutions. Yes, so you just find one of them. There's an extensive entropy of solutions. Yeah. So why, why is it called the problem then? Yeah, the, 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 the landscape is very simple. It has this huge global minimum. And then, it, then you know, uh, this is a language that comes from constraint satisfaction problems. Um, once, once there are too many constraints relative to your degrees of freedom, then you go through this transition. It's like the jamming transition. And then above it, um, uh, you have too many constraints and you can't satisfy them all. You end up in local minima. You, you can't reach the global minimum and get local minima where the error is not zero. So you can no longer learn. It's a degenerate set of things that equally well satisfy your learning, you know, minimize the learning. If you have enough, if you have enough constraints, then all your training examples, you reach zero error effectively. Okay. Yeah, which is all you care about. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Thank you for the great talk. Thank um, you. I guess one question I had was concerning the flexibility of the network to learn different tasks. So, like you showed um, the high risk classification task. Um, I wonder if that, like, a, I guess, implies that there are two like time scales the network operates on. Like maybe it operates in the short term, but also long term. Is there like any uh, like characterization of that? So, so far we've done things completely in the static limit. And we've even gone to the quasi-static limit in the sense that the physical degrees of freedom, the currents on all the edges equilibrate completely before we change the learning yeah. degrees of freedom, the conductances. Okay, and that's because this thing has a very small capacitance. So the time it actually takes to, to um, do the forward calculation for physics to minimize the physical cost function is determined by the capacitance. So it's, it's nanoseconds. Okay, it's just really, really fast. And so, so this thing is uh, really a totally static problem. And it'd be interesting to look at dynamics. That's actually in the proposal for the MERSEC that we're you know, going to have a reverse site visit for. So yeah. <laughs> fingers crossed that we will get the money to do that. But yes, I mean, we think that dynamics are incredibly important and interesting. And of course, what the brain does is to use dynamics. It doesn't do everything statically. So there, there's presumably some big advantage to that. Yeah. Um, OK, maybe we should take. There's a question way over there. Oh, I see. Uh, okay, let's take these two questions. And uh, yeah. Well, yeah. oh, um, I was wondering because we have this tricky network break, maybe it's an output break, part of the network, when you scale up to larger sizes, um, do you think it's possible to train the network on two or more diff different tasks simultaneously? Oh, yes. Yes. That's just. So, so that's just increasing the number of constraints. And all you need to do in order to do that is to make your network bigger so you have more degrees of freedom. So yeah, the bigger we make our network, the more complicated our task can be. And so for the flow networks you know, and mechanical networks, we have found that um, um, if you just say, suppose I, we did the case for a single source, the, what, that's the one case we looked at systematically, and we just increase the number of targets. How many targets can you satisfy in a network with about a thousand nodes? It's several hundred. Okay, biological systems don't get close to that. That's the, that's where the transition is. It's several hundred. Okay, and um, I think the key to being able to evolve it is to be well, well below that transition then you have essentially 100% success, nearly 100% success, and it's really easy. It's only when you get close to that transition that it starts to become hard. Okay. Oh, <laughs> okay, great, yeah. Well, uh, uh, let's thank Andrea for a wonderful <laughs>
I guess. Some things are